again. And we praise you for that. Well, we praise you for each one of the workshop leaders who so diligently studied their lessons and made wonderful presentations. Lord, we just pray that you would bless them and guide them and lead them even as they travel home. Then, Lord, we praise you for all the leaders, all the folks who participated. And then we praise you for the faithful members of CCDA that has come and supported this ministry. We praise you for that. Now, Lord, as we bring it to a close, we pray that you would lead us and you would guide us, that you would really speak to us this morning from your word. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. You can be seated. Chippy Chapman, I know him. Uh, is he here? Okay, his package and his stuff is right here. Oh, it was there. <laughs> okay, if you have your Bibles this morning, would you open them to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to begin reading in verse uh, 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll begin reading at verse 14. This will be the concluding of our Bible teaching for this um, uh, conference, and we'll begin to thank again then for, for Chicago, how wonderful it's going to be in Chicago. Chicago is going to be our, a big celebration. It's going to be the celebration of officially of our 10th anniversary of the CCDA movement. And we have some ideas. The, the, the city of Chicago or the people there is going to give all of us city passes that we can ride anywhere we want to go on the, on the bus. We're going to meet at Moody uh, Bible Institute and the Moody Church. Uh, we're going to be there. And this could be awesome, but we expect about 3,000 of you to be there. And then school is going to be in. Maybe we can influence 1,000 of those students who will be there with us. And so this will be an educational time for us. Then there's North Park College. We're going to try to influence that college. And we know the folks there get students from there. There's Trinity College, college there. And then there's other colleges there. We want to, this will be our a possibility an opportunity to really impact and, uh, and for the next 20 years, or the next 10 years, we could be able to almost double the impact of our Christian community development in this country. So it's really uh, going to be good. It's going to be a little different. We're going to take the, uh, we're going to have most of the work, we're going to have some workshops in the morning. We're going to have them there like we have here. And then every uh, afternoon, we're going to go out to the places like to Lundell, like the Circle Urban Ministry and the other and then they will put on the workshops there and that will inspire people to know what Christian community development is all about. You'll be able to see it and then you will come back then for that evening and then we'll have a great evening celebration there in the beautiful Moody Church. So it's going to be a, an outstanding time. You pray for it, pray for us and, and then we'll be there in the morning for our Bible, Bible studies there and we're going to, again, we're going to work with the Moody uh, school and try to get those students out there in the morning, try to get a thousand of those students in there into these Bible classes in the morning. What a great opportunity we have there to witness to Christian community uh, development here. Uh, the first morning, of course, we, we try to make these lessons relevant to the struggles that we are going through in life so that they can be as impactful as they can and so we can leave here. And we can return out the CCDA movement could not only be the movement of, of holistic development where we are dealing with the problem that people have in society, but I hope that we could uh, be the people who are seeking for renewal and revival. And that means that all of the revivals that I know about, the, the people who led those revivals had a concern for holiness Amen. and righteousness. And all
all of the prophets had a concern for the holiness of God. That's what they loved God and they understood that God was love and that God was just and that God was holy. And it was that zeal they went out and talked about God and they turned their people back to God. I think we've got to get a sense of the holiness of God. The righteousness of God. I think there's a possibility that we can become almost do-gooders. Do-gooders. And that we might lose that sense of the holiness and righteousness and justice of God. And so I hope that we can be the people who can be those people out there who are doing God's work, concerned about the broken and the homeless in society, but at the same time calling people the holiness in, in, in our society. And so we talked then about and, and righteous living. That's what I was trying to get at. And so our first time, we talked about integrity. Integrity. That was our first lesson. And then we used, we said we used Joseph. Uh, we used Joseph because you can't find nothing wrong with Joseph. You, you, know, you know, God usually reveals the def defects in our lives. We said it about David. But, but I think God had a purpose to show us a person like Joseph. Joseph becomes in the Bible a great model, uh, a prototype of Jesus Christ. You understand? And so we can be like Joseph. And then God showed us a, my hero in the Bible, and that guy was, uh, who was vulnerable, who exposed himself, and who confronted the king in a dark day, and we looked at Elijah. What a great prophet he was. And then um, yesterday morning, we looked at our New Testament hero. There is no doubt that the Apostle Paul is the New Testament hero. Because all that we know about the church, uh, we know it because of the teaching of the Apostle Paul. It, it was a special revelation that God gave to the Apostle Paul. And he went out and he established indigenous churches in the world. And, and so we looked at him and we looked at the fact that he was broken. This madman was broken on the Damascus Road and he was broken by God's love. God's love. He was able to see clearly, clearly, he was able to see the holiness of God when God reached down on that road and grabbed him, this bigot, on his way to destroy the Christian. He reached down and said, Saul, Saul, I love you. I love you. Why you don't love me? Who are thou, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. It's hard for you to keep on going against my love. Against my love. Laying there, he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And he said, I've called you to show you how much you can suffer for my name. And I'm going to send you to turn people from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God. I'm sending you far away to the Gentiles, the people that you are persecuting. I'm sending you away to them to turn them. And what we know what we know about, uh, really, about Christianity and biblical theology. Really, really, we know it from the teaching of the Apostle Paul. And so God used that broken person, you know, in society. And I, I want to say this yesterday morning. Uh, the people that I find many times that more flame for God is people who have been deeply broken, deeply broken. Uh, 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 Chuck Colson, uh, 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 people who, who, who really, working for God, they were in prison somewhere. They became completely embarrassed. Uh, they, were, they were in a situation where, where only God could restore them. And, and they was broken. And then they give their life to God, and God used them this morning. Now, what I want to do here this morning, uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, reconciliation this morning and, and give some meaning to it and at least I want to lay the basic foundation there is one passage of scripture in the Bible that really teaches reconciliation and that is really uh, where there is a, a context of reconciliation and that's this passage we're going to deal with this morning this is our basic teaching on reconciliation here and that's in the second Corinthian chapter uh, 5 beginning at verse 14. Let me read the whole text and then I'm going to come back and go through the text and we will have our teaching for this for, for, for this morning. So you, you, you there listen to me as I read the text here on reconciliation. Verse 14 says, for the love of Christ constraineth us 
because we thus judge that if one died for all, then was all dead. And if he died for all, they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet henceforth know him no more. Therefore, if any person be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And all things of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their transgression against them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. For he has made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. End of text. What would it mean to receive the grace of God in vain? This is the most serious passage of scripture in relationship to reconciliation in the Bible. And it, Paul says it's possible here to hear all of this and to receive the grace of God in vain. This is a serious text. This text here is serious as a text in Hebrews. It talks about if, if those people who have experienced the good work of God, tasted of the heavenly calling, been partakers of the divine nature, and all of that, if they should turn away from God to renew them again to repentance, seeing that they crucify afresh the Son of God and put him to an open shame. He said that those people, it's impossible for them to come back to God. It meant that those folks had received the grace of God in vain. What would it mean for you and I to receive the grace of God in vain? That's going to be our teaching here this morning. And so the first thing we need to understand before we get into it is what is the grace of God? What is the grace of God? The grace of God is a word that was really sort of almost created by the Apostle Paul. It was almost equal to David trying to think about the goodness of God as he related to the fact that here he was, the eighth son of Jesse, skinny young boy, 13 or 14 years old, and somehow he ended up being selected by God to become the greatest king that ever lived on earth and God molded that boy and it was God's grace who picked him up. David called that goodness and mercy. David had to have two words in order to put in words what he thought about God and he said surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He was seeing that as the grace of God. But it was the Apostle Paul who really coined this word, grace of God. And, and Paul coined it in relationship to our salvation. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So what is the grace of God? The grace of God is God so loving humanity when he created us and then Adam fell turn away from God almost like spit in the face of God and then in the light of that in that garden God said to Adam in a sense I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to work out an absolute plan so I can not only forgive you but I can redeem the human race yeah, yeah, yeah. and then God started in that garden of Eden to working out a plan of salvation 
And all we had in the, New, in the Old Testament was a prototype of God's redemptive plan. God trying to show us what he had in mind in terms of bringing us back. And that was a part of his love for us. And God himself took on the initiative. There was nothing that forced God to do it. It came completely out of his own heart of love. And so God took the initiative and started a redemptive plan. And that redemptive plan is throughout the Old Testament. And it finishes when Jesus Christ, God's only begotten son, who had lived in his presence throughout all eternity, after he had clothed him, after he had put, sent him into the world as a child and was with him all that 32 years and then hanging him up there on that cross. There we see God, the just, dying for the unjust that he might bring us back to God. We human beings had nothing to do with it. Yes. It was God's redemptive idea from the beginning to the ending. Yes. The grace of God is God's own plan, his own loving plan, and the extreme that he went to in order to redeem us back to himself. That is the grace of God. How did he foreshadow that? He foreshadowed that in the Old Testament. His greatest redemptive foreshadowing of that was with him uh, making a nation, particular nation, that he could send his son into. You, you know, and he did that. That was God's own act. And God was trying to show and demonstrate his own power, that God could make a people. And so he took Abraham. Abraham's father was an idolatrist. And God reached out there, pulled out one person out of that idolatrous family, and that was Abraham, pulled him out and revealed himself to him as being the one true living God. And you remember God said to him, all I want you to do, Abraham, is walk before me and be sincere. He said, I'm going to put you out here and you're going to become a pilgrim. You see, that's important that we understand that we Christians are supposed to be pilgrim people. I said that. We are not to be so caught up into this world that we are bound by it. We're supposed to be able to witness to the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the Communist Party, the Libertine Party, and all those parties. We're supposed to be able to witness to them. We're supposed to be able to hold up the light to them. We are not to get so buried down in them that we begin to echo their own belief. And I, I already said that. White America in conservative America reflects the Republican Party. And, 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 and Russ Limbaugh and people like that can be their evangelists because they reflect that. And, and they can feel lost. Middle America is lost in the Republican Party. And black folks are enslaved into the Democratic Party. They don't care what the Democrats do. And so we have sold our soul out to those parties. To those parties. Christians are not supposed to be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The Democrats don't have no perfect will. Yes, sir. And all of us know the Republicans are. I need some water. A little water. <laughs> I lost my voice. I'm hollering too loud. <laughs> so, so, so look, we are not to be enslaved to the system. We're to be pilgrimage people. You see, Abraham lived out there among those people, and he was a witness to him. God, from time to time, had to save him. You had to rescue him. Rescue him. And that was also showing the power of God. That God, I'm with you. I'm with you. And that's the revelation to Moses when he meets Moses and we get there. The thing about it, Moses said, I can't go back to all of those Canaanites. I can't go out there and all that stuff. And I can't even go down into Egypt and talk about me going before Pharaoh. I will only go if you go with me. And God said, truly, truly, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. You know, I got some water now, don't I? <laughs> Thank you. Two glasses. Two glasses. Drink it all day. Okay. 
And so the great redemptive plan of God, where we get the redemptive plan of God is in um, Moses delivering, of God delivering of the people of Israel out of Egypt. That story is the greatest story, and it's the greatest story of God's redemption. It's also the greatest story of God's love. God lets you look at humanity in those people that he reached down and pulled them out of slavery, put them out there in the wilderness, took care of them, fed them, and watched their rebellious act. But God was with them out there. And it's this whole idea of redemption, this whole idea of deliverance, that we get this word in the New Testament, it comes over. In the Old Testament, it's deliverance. In the New Testament, it comes over as salvation. Yes, sir. And salvation is the word in the Bible, the New Testament. That's the basic theological word for all of God's redemptive acts. Uh, out of this whole word salvation, you get justification, sanctification, all that kind of stuff. You don't get predestination and all that out of there. But it's all this comes out of, comes out, uh, comes out of this word uh, 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 salvation. Salvation means to then to be saved from the past. That God loved us enough that he saved us from slavery and he cut us loose from the past. Uh, that's the first aspect of salvation. The second aspect of it is that God is with us. That's an important element. That God is with you. That God lives among us and that he's there. That means the present tent of salvation, that God is with you. And then that future tent of salvation, that God is going to be with us. And not only that, but he's prepared a place for us in heaven. And that we'll be safe and secured in heaven. Those are the three aspects of this redemption. All of this shows God's love and God's concern for us. And out of all of that, of course, you, the other words, you see sanctification and, and, and justification and all of that, that all comes out of uh, justification, comes out of that first aspect of, of redemption, that, that he saved us from our past, and we're just as if we've never sinned. You, you know, and the very fact that this, uh, this, the fact that he's present with us now, that he wants to walk with us so that we can be sanctified, so we can have his presence. And, and the way we are sanctified really today, we're sanctified by his blood because he washes us day by day from our sin in his own blood. He himself keeps us sanctified. Yes, sir. But we're not keeping ourselves sanctified. And then he pla So all of the redemptive, y'all follow me? All the redemptive words that we use to try to explain uh, uh, theology comes out of this word salvation. Taking all of that together to show God's love and concern, and when we use the word grace, that's what we are saying. You got me? <laughs> And so when God says uh, that receive not the grace of God in vain, he's talking about receiving, all, uh, rejecting all of that which God had done for us. Because grace summarized all of God's redemptive plan. And so he said, for by grace are you saved. <laughs> yes, you see? Now let me go then and look at that. Let's look at it. Well, because I want you to see what it would look like to receive the grace of God in vain. Let me tell you right now what it would be before we go on. The receive grace, God's grace in vain is to be here at this conference this week and to have been in these seminars and that you have been in our Bible class every morning and you have understood all about God's redemptive plan and understood all about salvation and somewhere along the line 50 years ago or 25 years ago or yesterday you were saved by God's grace you rejoiced in it and you sometimes you prayed
Well, I want you to know the gift of being a reconciler is a gift that God gives to every member of his body. And if you are not being a reconciler, you have received God's grace in vain. In vain. Let me continue here as we finish it. He says then, um, to wit, did you know? Did you know, verse 19, did you know that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not accusing us of our sins, and he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That's our word. That's the gospel message. That's the purpose of the gospel. Do y'all know the purpose of the gospel? The purpose of the gospel is to reconcile alienated humanity to a holy God and to each other and to do that across racial, cultural, and social barriers and to make a new worshiping community so the world can know we are Christian because of the love we have one for another. That's the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You would almost think it's something else. You would almost think the end of the purpose is I be saved. My saved has an end, and my being saved is not the end. The end is that I might be a reconciler. That's the end. That I might be out there obeying God and sharing the gospel with others. That's the end. That's the end. And so you would always have prayer, I'm saved. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. That's a good place to start. In fact, that's the only place you can start to working for God is when you turn your life over to him. But now that you're saved, now what do you do? You're to be a reconciler. Okay, let me conclude. Now then, we ambassadors. Look what he says. We ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we praise you. We, we ask you uh, uh, to be reconciled, to stand in God's place and be reconcilers. He has made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us that we might be made the righteous of God in him. Then he closed this passage here. I should say a word here. That God has made us to be his righteousness. That God has closed us to be his righteousness. God has no other hand but our hand. He has no other feet but our feet. He has no other eyes but our eyes. We are his body. And we ought to stand on in God's place, in the neighborhood, in the community, and be reconcilers. The church is the continuation of the body of Christ here on earth. The church is the continuation of Jesus of Nazareth here on earth. God in Jesus of Nazareth showed us what to be and what we could be like. As he was, so are we in the world. And so we stand as God's righteous force. And you know, I'm, 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 uh, I, I never try to come on as being holier than thou and righteous and all that because I make too many mistakes. Too many mistakes. But I want you to know the best we can, we have to stand recognizing the fact that God has no other people to stand but you and me. Yes, and that you and I are standing in God's place. Yes. That's why we need the blood of Christ to wash us each day from our sin. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unright. He can make us righteous. That's the idea that I'm telling you and that we can stand in his place. Then, in finishing, he says then, in closing this text with the most serious words that he can close it with, with a serious warning, he says, we then, as workers together with him, I beg of you not to receive God's grace in vain. To receive God's grace in vain is to hear what you've heard today, to hear what you've heard this week, and to have an experience the forgiven grace of God and have benefited from the grace of God and then not to be a reconciler is to receive God's grace in vain. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this wonderful time. Lord, I thank you for your wonderful people. And what a joy it is to be here with them. And I just pray now, dear Jesus, that you would bless each person that's here. That you would be near to them. That you would guide them in all they're doing. 
In Jesus' name, amen. I have one little announcement before I go. And there can be another announcement. I have one little announcement. Uh, you folks and purchase a lot of books. And we want to put these books in people. Every time I talk to people and I ask them about CCDA, they say they got Wayne's Garden book, my book, or somebody's book. And it was those books that really turned them on. And so we really, we don't care about making money on books. We want to make money.